Well, good morning, saints. Good to see you guys after being away for two weeks. Thank you so much for the wonderful vacation and the time away. But man, it's good to be back. Open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. We're going to look at this entire short chapter this morning. It'd be so much better if you follow along. We're going to go verse by verse. But before we do, let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promise that you are here. We pray that you would do what only you can do by your spirit, that you would confirm and strengthen us in everything that's good, that you would convict us of the areas where we need to repent, and that we would grow more and more in our trust and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray all these things to the glory of his name. Amen. Well, folks, Acts chapter 6 is open in front of you, and over the last few weeks, we've been tracking through this account, the account of the earliest church as recorded by Luke in the book of Acts. And it's been fascinating for me. Have you guys enjoyed it so far? Yeah, it's been great, eh? Because we don't just read these accounts as something like, oh, that's what they did. Isn't that interesting? Instead, we interact with these accounts in the book of Acts, the earliest church, and we realize that they are instructive for us and our church today. They, these accounts show us how we as a church, a local church that is an expression of the body of Christ globally, it shows us what we ought to value, right? If the earliest church placed a high value on something, Guess what? So too should we. It shows us what we ought to do and what we ought to practice. If the earliest church did and practiced things, well, friends, this is God's instructive word, and it is profitable, and so when we read it, we then apply it and say, well, we ought to do the same things. It's more than just reading accounts. But as we're going to see this morning, it is also instructive for us because it shows us what we can expect as the gospel grows and moves forward. Now, I love that in these accounts in Acts, Luke is brutally honest with the early church. Have you noticed that so far? He doesn't polish off the rough edges. He doesn't try to make it all clean and nice. We're only weeks in, and not everything is perfect in this earliest church. See, when you're reading Acts chapter 6, you have to remember you're only a couple of weeks away from the day of Pentecost. So the earliest church is doing all these things. Thousands of people have come to believe and been baptized, but already the church is encountering problems. Back in Acts chapter 5, which, by the way, I was really sorry to miss those two passages. The preachers handled them really well, but man, I wanted to preach those. Um, In Acts chapter 5, we saw that there were difficulties of persecution from outside of the church. So the earliest church is already being persecuted by those on the outside. In Acts chapter 5, we also saw that there were problems of dishonesty and misrepresentation within the church, Ananias and Sapphira. And now we get to Acts chapter 6. And we return back to internal matters of the earliest church. This issue has come up and Friends, it's a serious one. If this issue is not handled well by the earliest church, it could potentially be destructive to this fledgling congregation. Verses 1 to 6. What is the problem? Well, perhaps you heard it when Nemasha read it. Verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose that the he- against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So what was the problem? The problem was that in the earliest church, there were widows who were being ignored, who were being passed over and not cared for. Well, if we're going to understand this problem, first we have to define what it meant to be a widow in the first century. Unlike today's world, where we have social infrastructure and safety nets to care for people, back then, if you were a widow, it was pretty much a sentence to poverty. You wouldn't be able to work. You wouldn't be able to care for yourself. 
And so you need to trust on the grace and kindness of others. To be a widow back then as it is today is also to have bad times fall upon you by no fault of your own. You know, there are so many scenarios where people find themselves in hardship and we harden ourselves against them. We harden our hearts and we say, well, I don't really feel like I need to help them because they brought this on themselves. Well, friend, you need to repent. (laughs) But also, in the case of widows, you don't even have that excuse. To be a widow back then was to find yourself destitute. The second thing that's important to notice in this problem in the early church, it was even more complicated than that. This earliest church already consisted of both Jews and Gentiles. The Jewish widows in the church were being provided for and cared for because the Old Testament Mosaic law had means by which Jewish widows were cared for. That was already built and baked right into the system. Maybe you've heard of the Leverite marriage in Deuteronomy chapter 25. There were measures by which Jewish widows were already provided for. Unfortunately, at this moment, we see that in the earliest church, there were no such provisions for the Hellenistic, the Gentile widows. They were left out in the cold. They were being shortchanged. So the earliest church we've read so far in these first five chapters of Acts, they were marked by a spirit of generosity for one another. They shared everything that they had. They looked for ways to support each other. We're told that No one was found in need except who? The Gentile widows. So what to do? Well, verse 2. It says, And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up preaching of the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty the duty of caring for the widows. So the 12 guys, the 12 apostles, they're sitting there. This problem comes to them. And they immediately had the wisdom to discern that this was not a problem that they should divert their attention from their primary task to address. Their primary role, they understood, was to be ministers of the word, to preach the gospel of Jesus. And so they said in verse 3, they said, well, you know, you guys have rightly pointed out and diagnosed the problem. It's true. There's a segment of our widows who are not being cared for. Now, you guys will be responsible for the solution. He said to all the disciples that were gathered together, the apostles said to them, I want you to pick out seven men who are going to be charged with this task. And these seven men need to be marked by particular character traits. They need to be men of good repute. They need to be full of the spirit and of wisdom. The apostles clearly understanding that they can't be distracted from their primary task to take care of this important task, they say to the disciples, pick out seven. Here are the parameters You pick them out, we will pray for them and appoint them to the task. Verse 4. The apostles then restated the importance of their task. They said, you guys are going to do that, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And then in verses 5 to 6, we see the men's names who were commissioned for this task. Good job reading them, by the way, Namasha. And we're introduced to Stephen. Stephen, whose story is going to unfold in the next chapter or two. Well, friends, what we have here in these first six verses is a clear paradigm for how to address issues and problems, not only in the church back then, but in the church today. The first thing I want us to take away from this, okay, is that 
If you find yourself in a church and you notice a problem and you bring that problem to the leadership, you'd better also either bring a solution or be willing to be a part of the solution. Did you see that in the text? These guys were right in pointing out the problem. He said, we've got this particular group of widows who are not being cared for. And the apostles said, awesome. You go and identify seven men who are going to care for it. So they brought the problem, but they were willing to be a part of the solution. Now, thankfully, this honestly seldom, if ever, happens at St. George's. We don't have a church that's marked by a critical spirit, and I'm thankful for that. But a lot of my friends who pastor churches tell me that in their churches, they have people who point out the problems without being willing to be a part of the solution. That's a cheap gift, and it's nowhere on the list of the gifts of the Spirit. If you're going to point out a problem, come with a solution or be willing to be a part of the solution. That's the first thing. The second thing is, and here's another really important one that we see in these six verses. The earliest church and the church throughout time must remain adaptive in its means, but unwavering and unshakable in its ends. Here's what I mean. You see right here in this earliest church that they encountered a problem, a problem that their existing structures was not addressing. It was a real problem in the church. And so under the leadership and guidance of the Holy Spirit, they said, hey, guys, we need to adapt the way that we are organizationally structured here to address that issue, but we can't ever compromise on the main thing, the preaching of Jesus and the word of God. Churches need to bring best practices to bear to accommodate what God is doing in their midst. The third thing that I want you to see from these six verses is this. This moment in the life of the early church shows us that Churches at their best are not either or, they're both and. Okay, let me tell you what I mean by that. Often churches are characterized by either an emphasis on the word of God or an emphasis on social justice and caring for the needy and the poor. Either or. But what we see in the earliest church is not either or, it's both and. It is an affirmation and an enshrinement of the central principle of preaching the word of God and preaching Jesus that then results in caring for the widows and the poor. Not either or, but both and. And the only way that they could do that was by being really clear on the centrality of the preaching of the word. The earliest church we see in Acts chapter 6 is adaptable in its systems and in its organizational structures, but rock hard and unwavering in its priorities. Friends, there's something for us to learn from that, isn't there? What does that mean for us? Well, I think as it lives out here at St. George's, the first thing to say is that we are, feel free to shout it out, we are St. George's Anglican Church. That's right, we're an Anglican Church. And if you're here this morning, um, you probably fall into one of these different categories. We have a handful of people who are cradle Anglicans, born into Anglican households, raised in Anglican churches, and still a part of an Anglican church today. We have another group of people who have joined us from other evangelical churches in the area, and now they find themselves strangely going to a thing called an Anglican church. The third category is maybe you got saved recently and baptized and you actually don't give a rip what the name is on top of the church. But the fact of the matter is St. George's Anglican Church, over the last 10 years in particular, we've tried to engage in this process of saying, what are the things that we can accommodate and change to meet up with what God is doing in our midst? while still holding rock hard to the centrality of our, 
of our purpose, the word of God in sacrament and in the language of the people. That's why this church looks the way that it does when you come on a Sunday morning. That's why we have the culture that we do. We're trying to do just this, what they're doing in Acts chapter 6. Far too often, Anglican churches fail to do this kind of thing, and they end up majoring in the minors. They end up defining themselves by outer trappings or by history. Well, there's very good reasons why churches, why, why, sorry, why cars have 98% windshield and only 2% rearview mirror. You get that one reversed, and you got big problems. See, what the point is, churches have to adapt by holding on to the central value of the Word of God. We're Anglican, so we do so. We're also a growing church. Our church over the years has grown to the point that our existing structures and organization just wasn't meeting our needs anymore. And so, through the leadership of some capable people, we've undertaken strategic planning initiatives to refine and to reorganize. We are refocusing and renewing our efforts in growth groups to try to get all of us plugged in into our walk with the Lord, discipling. These are all ways that we are accommodating our approach while never budging on our central value of the Word of God. Another thing that we're doing, we hold on to the Word of God and still look for ways to reach out and care for the needy. For the last two Sundays, you've heard about this new initiative that we are joining called the Next Door Social Space. And it's our hope and prayer that our church can take one Saturday morning a month to reach out into our community and serve them. But let's be really clear. We're not just, you know, the goodwill or some other social safety net that is going to feed people. We're St. George's Anglican Church. We're going to do it with a commitment to the Word of God. We're going to reach out and serve these people in their need because we're deeply convinced that every man and woman must be born again. The earliest church in Acts chapter 6 realized that they had to adapt while never shifting from the centrality of God's Word. And churches still today have to do the same thing. You know, I, I think one of the things... So when, when new people come to our church and when new people stay, I always ask them, why did you come? And why are you still coming? And often the answers fall into a couple of different categories, right? People love the worship music at our church. Um, they love the sense of community. They love the potluck lunches. They love Thursdays once a month at Kelvin's. You know, there are all these different touch points. But another common thing that we hear is that St. George's is unique because we preach the Bible. We don't just give topical sermons or TED Talks or our own opinions or whatever we were reading throughout the week. We actually just go verse by verse through the Word of God. I think one of the reasons that we're able to do that in a unique way is because our church has structured with a proverbial anecdotal kind of seven that's actually many more than that number. Look, let me say it a different way. The only reason that I'm able to give myself to the Word of God the way that I do is because Ed and Nimasha and Jonathan and Stephen give themselves to the governance of the church as the executive council. Do you see what I'm saying? That's the model of the early church. People who come alongside and do things organizationally so that other people can give themselves to the Word of God and to prayer. The only reason that I can do this is because Shauna Lee gives herself day in and day out to the administration of the church. Because Deb gives herself to organizing the greeters and the communion table, and Monica gives herself to putting out cookies and coffee, and you know, you fill in the blanks. That's how the church works. You can only keep the central thing central as the other things happen through the empowering of the Holy Spirit and through all of us. 
That's how it works. Churches adapt while holding on to an unwavering commitment to the Word of God. And I praise God for that here. That's the problem and the solution in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. Look at verse 7. What you see in verse 7 is a biblically normal result of a church that has addressed their issues and problems well. Let me say that a different way. When you have good, godly, prayerful governance in a church that holds to the centrality and prominence of the ministry of the word, there are three verbs that always happen. You see those three verbs in verse 7? The word increased. The number of disciples multiplied. And a great many of the priests became obedient. Anytime there is good governance and good order that puts the focus on the word of God in the church, you're going to have these three things happening. The word of God is going to grow and increase. What a lovely metaphor that's used in a couple of places in scripture. It's used here. Paul also uses a similar analogy when he's addressing his letter to the church in Colossae. He says that the gospel has been growing from the first day until now. It's almost as though our efforts and our adaptations in the local church, really what we're trying to do is not to cause the gospel to grow or increase. We're just trying to get out of the way. We're trying to make adaptations and accommodations and structures and organization so that we can build something of a trellis for the gospel to grow. It's going to grow either way. We're just, we're, I, don't, I don't exactly know the metaphor, but you see what I'm getting at. We don't cause the growth. The second thing is disciples are being multiplied. Well, friends, I thank God for this season in our church here at St. George's where that's directly correlated to an increase in our numbers. You know, gospel, the gospel is growing. Um, disciples are being multiplied. Our average Sunday attendance is increasing. God is blessing in that way. But there are other times where it actually works counterintuitively. The gospel grows, disciples are being multiplied, but the net numbers of a church appear to be dwindling. How does that work? Well, we've seen it earlier in Acts, where the numbers appear to be sifting and shifting, declining, and yet the scriptures say that the disciples were being multiplied. Because those people who were falling away were never really true disciples in the first place. And there's a depth to the discipleship and commitment that comes out when churches function in a biblically normal way. Disciple, gospel growing, disciples multiplying, and a whole bunch of the priests are being obedient. When a central place is given to the word of God in a church that is adapting and addressing issues, People in that church will be growing under the lordship of Jesus. They'll be asking questions like, well, Jesus is my lord and king. What should I do with my time? Jesus is my lord and king. What should I watch on Netflix? Jesus is my lord and king. What should I be doing with the money that he's entrusted to me? To steward growing in obedience. Those things are all biblically normal when churches function in the proper way. All right, verses 8 to 15. So this potentially disastrous problem within the earliest church has been addressed. They've fixed it. And through the process of addressing this issue, they haven't just fixed the issue, but the church itself has been strengthened. Now, I want you to look at that for a moment and consider. Anytime an issue comes up in a church or a problem comes up, we always think, man, I sure wish that this hadn't come up. But what if issues and problems and challenges in churches come up because they are God's grace and mercy to that congregation. 
Firstly, because when the issue comes to the fore like it did here, you can address it and fix it. But secondly, through the process of addressing it and fixing it, the church grows in relationship with one another. And the church grows more deeply in their trust of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this church that we read about in Acts chapter 6 addresses this problem. They begin to care better for their Hellenistic widows. You would think that that would be met with nothing but goodwill, right? You'd think that the outside world would be watching and say, man, verse 8, Stephen, that guy, he's full of grace and power. He's developing a reputation for doing good, one, great works and great wonders and signs among the people. You'd think everyone would look at that and say, isn't that awesome? Stephen's just such a good guy caring for the marginalized. But instead, Stephen's work is met with hostility. And even more so, look at verse 9. It isn't just that the general population are hostile to Stephen for his work. It's the men from the synagogue of the freed men. Look at that closely. Remember the problem in the earliest church was that the Hellenistic Gentile widows were not being cared for in the same way as the Jewish widows. They were being shortchanged. The apostles organized so that seven men, led by Stephen, would address that need for the Hellenistic widows. And the guys who get upset about it are the men from the synagogue of the freedmen They are Cyrenians, Alexandrians from from Cilicia and from Asia. They're Gentiles. They're Hellenistic Jews, actually. These are the very guys who should have been taking care of their own widows in the first place. And so it's profoundly ironic that they're the ones who are upset when Stephen and the guys start taking care of them. They should have been taking care of their own widows in the first place. And at the very least, they should have been thankful when Stephen and the other six stepped into the role that they had abdicated. But they weren't. They persecute Stephen. They persecute the early church. Now we're going to watch as this story unfolds over the next couple of weeks. But we're going to see that not even this kind of persecution will spell disaster for the earliest church. That God has a plan in and through this persecution. One of the things that God accomplishes is that it is precisely this persecution that moves the earliest church out from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, and to the uttermost. Up until now, they've been ministering right in the heart of Jerusalem. We're told that the disciples, verse 7, greatly multiplied in Jerusalem. We're told of thousands of people at a time in Jerusalem responding to the gospel and being baptized. Apart from persecution, it would have been far easy for these first Christians to just become comfortable and complacent in Jerusalem and never fulfill the commission given to them by the Lord to go to Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost. And that's the point. Those who were bringing persecution to bear on this earliest church were unwittingly being used by God to ensure that the disciples carried out his commission. Now the same is true for us today. When Christian men and women, when Christian churches endure persecution, we're far too quick to rise up with looking for political power looking for ways to fight back. And there are certainly places and times for that, but it shouldn't be our first response. Our first response should be to say, where is God in this? What is God teaching us through this? What is his plan? What is he bringing about through this persecution?
I want you to look closely at the charges that are brought against Stephen in verse 10 forward. These men of the synagogue of the freedmen bring these charges against Stephen, and the very first thing they try to do is just to debate him. And what are we told in verse 10? We're told that they couldn't stand up to his arguments. They couldn't stand up to the arguments that Stephen presented, first of all, because they were, what Stephen was saying was true, and secondly, because it was from God. So they rounded up a bunch of lackeys, they drummed up false charges, and they began to attack Stephen personally. That's what unfolds in verses 10 to 15. The first thing I want you to see in this is the strength and the weight of truth. Look, friends, we live in a world where we're told that truth is relative. Truth is subjective. Everybody has their own sense of truth, and who's to say what's really true? We're told that truth is ultimately unknowable. And yet what we see in a passage like this is something that we already intuitively know. Truth is like a rock. Truth is like a fortress. Truth carries with it a gravity and a weight that you can just feel it, right? When somebody says something that's true, you can feel it in that moment. And nothing can stand against it, especially the truth of God's word. They try to argue with Stephen, and they can't, because what he's saying is true, and it's from God. The second thing I want you to see is the progression in this. The adversaries of the gospel and the adversaries of Stephen, they try to argue with him. They fail. And so they very quickly turn ad hominem. Perhaps you've experienced the same thing, too. You're sharing God's word with someone. You know where you'll particularly feel this is when you're sharing God's best with someone concerning their life, and they just don't want to hear it. They will try to argue against you, but you have truth and God on your side, and their arguments will fall flat. So then they'll move to ad hominem attacks. They'll tell you that you're homophobic. They'll tell you something about your personal character, and you're like, no, no, I'm actually loving and trying to share with you God's word and God's best for you. They can't deal with the arguments, so they move to a personal attack. That's what they did to Stephen, too. And the third thing we see in this progression, start with arguments, doesn't get anywhere, move to personal attack, still doesn't get anywhere, so they move to false accusations. Now, in Stephen's case, these accusations, verses 11 to 14, they were saying Stephen was blaspheming against Moses and against God. And yet in verse 15, we're told that they gaze upon him. Do you see that in verse 15? Now, the literal translation from the original language is not gaze. It's more like stared. Back with Peter and John at the Gate Beautiful and the man who was lame from birth, we saw that loving eye contact can be a humanizing act. But to stare at someone is to dehumanize them. To stare at someone is to treat them like an object, a thing, and not a person. And that's exactly what they're doing to Stephen in this moment. They're not listening to him. They're not engaging with him as a human being with complex thoughts and ideas. They're objectifying him using what we today would call identity politics, putting him into a group so that we can dismiss him. They are pointing their fingers and their legal clout at him in what we're, we're going to see as a miscarriage of justice that leads to execution. And so they have to dehumanize him. And yet in that moment, they're staring at him to dehumanize him, and yet they still see him for what he truly is, an angel. Look at verse 15. And gazing at him, all who sat on the council 
saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Now look, that doesn't mean like angel in the cartoon sense, right? They didn't look at him and then see that he had wings and a harp. No. They looked at him and saw that he was a messenger of God. He had a face that was radiant with the glory of the gospel of Jesus. This moment of unjust, undeserved persecution. Wicked men, evil men, they're taking his good, godly deeds and twisting them. And Stephen sits there like his Lord Jesus Christ. And when he is reviled, he reviles not. He subjects himself to the righteous judge. And so his face shines with the glory of the messenger of God. Can you think of other moments in Scripture where people's face shone with the glory of God? In Exodus chapter 33, Moses says, God, I want to see you. God says, you can't see me. If you behold me, you're going to die. He says, but I'm going to tuck you away in the cleft of a rock. And so Moses is tucked away. The Lord God passes by. Moses catches just the slightest glimpse of him. Moses then returns back to the camp of the congregation of the Israelites. And what's happened? His face is shining with the radiant glory of God. He is like the moon to the sun, reflecting the effulgent light of the glory of God. That's Moses. Same as Stephen. Can you think of another place? Matthew chapter 17, the transfiguration of Jesus Christ, where God the Son, the veil is pulled back and he is beheld shining in the glory of God. Friends, that's exactly what's happening with Stephen at this present moment. And don't miss the beautiful irony in this. He's been accused of blaspheming Moses and God. And yet here he sits, silent so far, with his face glowing with the very same radiance of Moses and God the Son. Here's the point. Christian man or woman, you are never more like your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, than when you face unjust persecution for God and you do so faithfully. In those moments, the very glory of God will exude from you. When your co-workers, when your family, when your friends persecute you for the gospel, just like Moses, just like Jesus, just like Stephen, you will shine with the glory of God. Look, the entire world will stare at you, but the Lord God will smile upon you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask and pray that by your spirit we would be empowered as a church family, that we would be led by the spirit and kept on track to keep the main thing the main thing while adapting everything else to accommodate what you're doing here in our church. God, give us a renewed passion not only for your word but also for the care of the widows, as it were. God, I pray that when persecution inevitably comes and increases, that we will be found like Stephen, empowered by you to be your messengers. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.